you for your wonders. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us so much in these days. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit, let me decrease, that you increase. Jesus, reach out and touch each one of us here with your healing love, your merciful love. Mary, spouse of the Holy Spirit, intercede for us. Amen. Amen. I was deeply touched by this morning between Paddy and Matthias. And I want to share, I'm going to speak to you about some of the ways that Jesus has taught me in the healing ministry. But before I do that, I want to give a beautiful testimony confirming Paddy's word to us this morning. And she told you that I brought uh, some little cards with a dedication to Our Lady. I'm very sorry, and here's me that loves Poland, goes there a lot, I'm there every year. But I couldn't get the Polish one translated fast enough. Anyway, Our Lady put it on my heart one morning when I was praying to bring these, this simple dedication and that as a mother, she wanted to be a mother of the fraternity because as the woman clothed with the sun, the woman who crushed the head of the serpent, the woman who constantly is known as the queen of prophets, is, wants to be very active in the heart of the fraternity and the family. And I didn't know that Patty, at the same time, had a sense in her heart that she was to bring the miraculous medal and give it to the fraternity. Now, let me tell you my experience with um, Our Lady in powerful interventions. You know, sometimes when you pray and say, Lord, do whatever you want with me. Send me where you want. Let me talk to the people Give me a chance. I'm always saying to the Lord, Lord, I get a bit nervous, but I get over it fast. So let me talk to people that can make a difference. So I was in Brazil many times, way back in the 70s and 80s. And one day, I was listening to a lot of people, including some of my own Irish missionaries. And they were you know, really angry you know what, some of the things that were going on. And one day, I heard the Lord saying to me, will you go if I send you to the president of Brazil? And I, my interpreter was with me, and I said, boy, wouldn't it be great? Because I'd love to find out all I'm hearing about him. I arrive in Brasilia to uh, give some talks, and one of the people who invited me said, it's very unusual, there's a person here from the presidential palace and the president has requested he'd like a meeting with you. So I was told, well, don't say anything. So I went there and uh, it was the Lord certainly gave me a very powerful word. And I spoke to uh, the president, and I challenged him about being Catholic, and I talked to him about many things. I asked to be alone with him with my translator. So about six months later, I was at home in Dublin, in Ireland, and I was alone, away in a monastery, just having some quiet days with the Lord. My mother general phones me, and she said, I don't know if this is a joke, but she said at six o'clock this morning, there was a call and it said it was from the presidential palace in Brazil. 
she thought one of these Irish priests were fooling me. So she said, they're very anxious to talk to you. Now, I was going to Brazil. It was planned. So I was asked, could I make it a little earlier? Anyway, it turned out that this particular man was ill. Now, before I left to go, I was going anyway to Brazil to speak and to give priest retreats in Porto Alegre and different places. The priest I work with, who is a Vincentian, and of course the Miraculous Medal was the apparition of Our Lady to a Vincentian nun, Catherine Labre. So he prayed with me, and he said, Breach, I have a sense that you should take these medals with you when you go. So I left for Brazil. I had all these medals with me, but I didn't think anything. And I arrive at the presidential palace. And the president's sick. And he's, you know, when you're sick, you begin to worry about your past life because you think you're going to die. Anyway, I'm with him, and I'm kneeling at his bedside, talking to him and trying to evangelize. And then I heard a voice saying to me, Give him the medal. Tell him about his mother. So I took out the miraculous medal and I said, Mr. President, it's very small. It's not a charm. It's not superstition. And I told him, it's when you wear an emblem or you see these young people with, you know, the world youth, you know, they're telling you something. When you wear this emblem, Mary said to Catherine Labre, those who were, she designed this medal. This medal isn't somebody's idea. Mary herself appeared to Catherine Labre and she showed her both sides of the medal. And she said, those who wear this medal, it's an outward sign of your love and it will give you inner grace. And I don't know if you know that the, after Catherine Labre Nobody knew it was her, but when the medal was struck, the bishop was very hesitant. But then a good friend of his, the Empress of Brazil, was very ill, and he thought, hmm, this medal I, I'll give to her. And she was the first person who had a miraculous, it was called the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. But of course, it became known as the Miraculous Medal because of the intervention of our Blessed Mother with those who wore it. Anyway, back to the present. So I told him. And he went off to the Mayo Clinic and whatever his illness was, thank God, as I often say, that through doctors and medicine and which God uses everything, he had a wonderful recovery. And he then requested two things of me. One, he said, would I be willing, as uh, Gilberto said yesterday, would I be willing to speak to his cabinet and to the governors? And, and then he said, and I'd like you to speak to my household. So I thought his household is the maids and servants and, you know, people who work around the house. <coughs> to discover that when I arrived there, it was the military. So I took this little medal, I pinned it on every military uniform, and I watched men crying, dropping their guns and covering their faces as their hearts, I put my hand right on their heart. Then I went to see, he asked me to go see the jeweler. He said, I, this medal has really blessed me. I, uh, my openness to Our Lady and talked about, he said, I would love to get it made here in Rio de Janeiro for my family, but I need you to go and talk to the jeweler, the man who's going to make it. So I go there with my translator, and I begin to talk to this jeweler in Rio de Janeiro, and as I'm speaking about Jesus and his mother and telling him the story, he goes berserk and starts screaming, foaming at the mouth, lying down, and I'm looking at him, and thank God there was a priest there. So father took him out and had an exorcism, delivered him because he was into the occult. 
and even to talk about Mary affected him. He had a wonderful, absolutely wonderful deliverance. Came back to the church, was completely transformed just through hearing about this mother. And it was some years later, it's a long story, some years later, I went back there. And the president asked me, would I fly with the vice president to Our Lady of Aparecida? Because he had a desire to consecrate Brazil to Our Lady. Not the, not, this was not part of the church's doing. So you can imagine me, I arrive there, and the vice president is flying with the whole cabinet, an Air Force One or whatever they call it, and I spent my time ministering to all these ministers on the plane. And when we arrived in the Paris Eater, there were thousands there. These Irish missionaries are looking at me with a big badge presidential party and thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> but, you know, I've often thought of how, you know, when we heard Brazil, you hear a lot of bad things, but there's wonderful things happening all over Brazil. No wonder Our Lady, this is the second time, this great intervention, because those from Brazil know that it was through the rosary that protected your country when the women up took to the streets and thousands to save Brazil. So that's when Patty was speaking. Don't make light of it. And as a Catholic fraternity, don't be intimidated. Because you, you have ecumenical connections, don't deny, because they also, she's their mother too. Because Billy Graham, the great Protestant evangelist, Baptist, said at a Baptist convention in, in Florida or in the South, after all, this was his words, it's about time that we Baptists honoured the mother of our saviour, Mary. The, it, there is an amazing openness coming to the realization of the prophetic words of this woman of Scripture. She's a woman of the Bible. She's not accidental. It says, all generations will call me blessed. So rejoice. And with Patty, I'm no doubt that both of us, without knowing it, got this strong word to tell the fraternity, love your mother. We are going to need this mother as the battle rages because she will protect us. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk to you about healing. But I'm going to share with you, and many of you may have heard me before share in this way, on healing in the scriptures. For this last 40 years, I have been ministering worldwide in a healing ministry. But I've come to realize that the most powerful means of healing is the proclamation of the gospel. The word of God preached, and this is what I tell priests and bishops all the time and deacons, and I would say it to all of you, us whom God has blessed, and many of you who are wonderful preachers of the word. I had an experience in Australia when the priest I work with, Father Kevin, and he would say himself, you don't have to be, you know, people sometimes think, I have to be a wonderful preacher. I have to be very charismatic. I have to be very loud. No. The word of God, through the anointing that's on bishops, priests, those proclaiming the gospel, it goes out with power. And I remember my first alert was one day in a convent. It's just a regular weekday. And Father Kevin was saying mass, celebrating the Mass, and he got up to speak, um, and as far as I remember, he was talking about the realization 
that the word is alive and active and what the word of God can do when it's received. And as he was preaching, there was a blind nun with a white cane in front. And as he continued to speak, she started to cry. And she began to say, oh my God, I'm getting my sight back. I lost my sight as a child. And before the end of the Mass, she had perfect vision. Nobody prayed with her. But it began as the Word of God was being proclaimed. And you and I know, brothers and sisters, from our own teachings as Catholics, that in the Catholic Church, we have two tables, as the early father said, the table of the Word, which is very powerful, which is another means which we receive God's power, and, of course, the word, the altar of sacrifice. And so since that time, I used to go, and when I started in the ministry first, I used to get so nervous that I would go with all these books, and I had Barbara Schleeman and Francis McNutt and all kinds of people quote, who were known to be world-renowned healers. And I used to think, I teach first grade. I don't know a thing about healing. So I went away to a monastery with Mother Angelica. You know EWTN? Many of you are familiar. Well, this is when Mother Angelica had just five nuns, no TV, no radio. It was just a small, quiet monastery. And I went there to spend time in adoration. And as I'm sitting there, I'm saying, now, these are 15 reasons why people are not healed. And 15 more reasons why they're healed. So I said, I'll learn them off. And if anybody asks me, I'll be able to answer them. So I learned them off. Next morning, they're gone. So I couldn't get it into my head, and I, but I kept praying. Mother Angelica.